Um, thank you very much for coming in a wonderful, fabulous summer. And I heard the song Summer by Calvin Harris. Summer, that's magic in the air. And this morning in my class, I was talking about the uh, path love dog, the conditioning uh, of advertising that you put her a jug of milk with happy family scenarios, happy gatherings, then you associate the jug of milk with happy feelings. I have the same feeling about my talk because my talk is such located in such a beautiful summer afternoon with food, with lots of good friends and students. So you will remember me, not as, as an academic person, natural, you will remember summer and angel and summer and angel <laughs> and magic, magic in the air, angel in the air, summer in the air. <laughs> so that's how it works, advertising. So this morning we were discussing that. So uh, I just feel so privileged and so uh, thankful for having a chance to come, come back to uh, Canada. Uh, I was here 10 years ago. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, something I have done in Hong Kong, and this is based on a paper I published uh, in TESOL Quarterly just, uh, I think, last year, uh, 2013. So you can just Google, Scholar Google, and you will. And I've put everything in open access. That is, you know, you can put your manuscript version of your published papers uh, kind of uh, in uh, open access. So you can just Google and you can find the paper or from the library. So, but it's based on something I published and also based on something I'm doing right now. So at the end of the uh, PowerPoint, I will uh, click onto a uh, word file and show you uh, some ongoing work I'm doing. Right. So I need to explain why I have two legs in two areas. Uh, my Hong Kong colleagues just cannot get their heads around it. They think, angel, hip hop, okay? Because I've been doing hip hop research, hanging out with these cool independent hip hop artists in Hong Kong, um, and also doing Korean TV dramas. So my critical cultural studies leg, okay? And then another leg is very much grounded in the classroom. So one leg in critical cultural studies, one leg in uh, education, uh, TESOL, uh, academic literacy, second language literacies. So I find that the two areas actually help me, help me to be grounded, uh, because uh, in a TESOL leg, it tends to be overly, overly technicalized, uh, especially in uh, East Asian context when people talk about TESOL or academic literacies. Uh, they say, oh, okay, teaching, teaching students English. Okay. They, they think of uh, a technical, uh, the best technology to teach English in East Asia. So you have all this billboard advertising of the Wall Street Institute, which mainly is a tutorial center teaching English. As you can have all kinds of English tutorial centers uh, in East Asia, in China, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan. And then the other link, which is in cultural studies, helps me to understand what is happening. And especially subjectivity theory, that we, 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 my students in my class hear me talk about subjectivity all the time, the Foucauldian notion of subjectivity. And today I'm going to marry the two kinds of research traditions, uh, trying my best I can, to understand um, what's happening in a classroom is also deeply, deeply uh, related to what's happening in terms of culture, in terms of your subjectivity. Uh, subjectivity meaning what kind of person I am, what kind of subject, uh, playing on the, the, the word subject, the verb subject, the so Foucault was playing on this word pun, the verb subject, I have been subjected to all kinds of institutional disciplinary forces which have made me the subject, okay? the colonial subject, the post-colonial subject, uh, the Asian subject, uh, the woman subject, or the ESL subject, the EAL subject that I am. So I'm trying my best to marry these two kind of research traditions, uh, TESOL, second language learning, second language education, and critical cultural studies, the production of subjectivity, the production of identities in the classroom. So, don't know if this has, uh, has, uh, has uh, dispelled the magic, okay? <laughs> oh, okay, so first of all, 
this is the outline. Um, these are the topics. And I will uh, talk about mainly content lessons okay, in the EAL context, content uh, taught in the L2. Uh, okay, so that's the L9. So um, first of all, you must have heard of all these, uh, all these terms these days. Uh, bilingualism, multilingualism, plurilingualism, and the related concepts. So you have the uh, older names, co-mixing and then co-switching, and then the more recent names, translanguaging, uh, kind of garages, co-meshing, plurilingualism, heteroglossia, and then uh, an Indian scholar talks about uh, pre-colonial Indian communities are uh, people um, speaking many different languages during their everyday life and there's this idea of co-floating, coats floating okay. So all these uh, recent uh, notions, um, it has a central theme, okay, different names but a central theme, which is language cannot be conceptualized and thereby taught or learned as a bounded entity, as a fixed monolithic bounded entity with solid boundaries. If there are boundaries, then these boundaries are porous and interpenetrating. So the plurilingual nature of classrooms these days and of classroom interactions and the plurilingual nature of our communicative toolkit repertoires of both learners and teachers are diversifying uh, these days uh, everywhere. Um, I'm sure in Vancouver or in, even in East Asian societies, um, your students come with a whole repertoire of diverse linguistic resources and also for teachers. So, um, and these resources are resources rather than positioned as a barrier to language and content learning. Okay, so. Um, so the recent movement in our, in our TESOR literature is to break away from the, from the notion that languages are unitary, monolithic, or static, and then, and then we, these languages, they will cut through the pedagogical structure imposed by uh, linguistic purism and monolingualism uh, that are dominant in the literature of education uh, policies, especially those, I cannot speak for North America, but for East Asian context. Uh, this is strong ideology about uh, purism in the language, separation of languages in the classroom, uh, and the immersion, literally immersion approaches. So, and this is a quote from Suresh Kanagaraja. Uh, Once we acknowledge that languages are inherently hybrid, grammars are emergent, and communication is fluid, we are left with the problem of redefining some of the most basic constructs that have dominated the field of linguistics, and I would add TESOL education. So, but let's review the dominant ideologies about language, language use, and language learning in the TESOL discipline. So these, um, these paradigms, um, they have been shaped by a combination of monoglossia, uh, purism, and I'll talk a bit later about the global trends of capitalizing and commodifying language and language education, especially bilingual education in Southeast Asia has, has been constructed and uh, co constituted as a precious commodity. So um, the first uh, strand of ideologies is essentialist view of languages. Um, this view sees languages as stable, standardized, monolithic, and discrete entities. And from that comes the recommendation of monolingual immersion approaches. So 
Um, last Friday, I was giving a talk at Simon Fraser, and I was talking about um, the different research indicating that, at least in Southeast Asia, in pre-colonial days, um, we didn't have all these boundaries around the languages. Um, for example, um, Hindi and uh, and Hindi is sorry, uh, and then Urdu, uh, the two languages. Hindi, the official language of India, and Urdu, the official language of Pakistan. Um, in pre-colonial days, actually, the two languages are mutually intelligible, and they call it the uh, Hindustani. And uh, I was in a conference in Pakistan two years ago, and I met with a scholar. He has written a whole book on when Hindustani has become differentiated into Hindi and Urdu for religious reasons, for colonial administrative reasons. So, and the languages with solid boundaries is not a natural linguistic uh, phenomenon saying, oh, this is natural language existing by itself and separate, uh, separate from another language. But if you see language as a, a piece of fabric, okay, like a piece of fabric, then you can, the tailor, can impose a boundary and then the tailor can be the political uh, colonial uh, administrator uh, for the divide and rule purposes, or for religious religious reasons or for political reasons, can impose boundaries upon these uh, the fabric of of language and call standardizing it, uh, calling it an official language uh, as separate. The same happens in in the tradition of uh, Chinese. Uh, languages. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, lots of people say they speak and write in their mind, they speak and write the Chinese language. They call it Zhongwen, Zhongwen Chinese language. And with this notion, they mean spoken Cantonese and written standard Chinese. But in their, in our concept, is Zhongwen is a Chinese language, okay? We don't differentiate as Cantonese, which is not a language, it's just a dialect. On, and then Mandarin Chinese, which is the official language, we didn't differentiate between these two until after the handover. Then increasingly, uh, motherland China is saying Cantonese is, is not a language, it's a dialect. And then Mandarin Chinese is the, the language, the mother language, your first language, your mother language. So, um, so this kind of political boundary setting, boundary making, um, is different from uh, when you say, oh, this is a different language, this is a different language. Okay? So I just would like to heighten our, our critical awareness about when does the language becomes a language, okay? Becomes bounded up, separate, and uh, as uh, hierarchicalized. Uh, before Zhongwen is whether you're speaking Chiu Chao East, Hakka, or Cantonese, you're all speaking Zhongwen, you're all speaking China lang Chinese language. But then when, you, when the officials come in, then they set up a hierarchy of the official Chinese language and all the so-called dialects, they become uh, subordinated in the linguistic ladder. So that's the uh, first uh, ideology. Um, whereas we know that languages, I mean, as we practice communication, are fluid resources for situated social practice. So we are translanguaging all the time. And uh, the other day I was speaking, I was speaking to Patsy in Mandarin Chinese, okay? I forgot, okay? And then I was sometimes, in Hong Kong, I was speaking to my partner in Cantonese, my partner is uh, Australian. So we speaking all kinds of, in our everyday practice, we just want to communicate, and we are not um, saying, okay, I only speak one language um, in this room, okay. So I know that someone can understand Cantonese here, so I'm going to do translanguaging <laughs> into Cantonese. Okay. So. Um, the second ideology um, is this zero-sum game, or this, uh, what Jim Cummings calls the limited capacity container metaphor of our mind. Okay? Limited capacity minds, that metaphor. That is, uh, we have limited capacity, okay? 
um, brain has limited capacity, so we shouldn't crowd it with so many languages. Right? So one thing at a time. So this zero-sum game, the assumption was is that um, the limited cognitive processing capacity of the individual, it's like a com computer, you have limited RAM, right? um, memory. Um, and then if you are learning too many languages, you are dispersed over too many different linguistic systems. So uh, we are metaphoric metaphorically constructed as limited capacity containers. Um, but we know that actually it's not, it's not that. The more languages you learn, the faster you are in picking up a new language. So it's, it's unlike this limited capacity container metaphor. So the real challenge is, is not that um, this is a cognitive computer here and it has limited memory. Uh, the challenge is not that. The challenge uh, in TESOL practice is students resist learning the language that you want to teach, whatever it is. It might be, for example, in Hong Kong, it might be Mandarin Chinese, okay? Uh, they resist Putonghua, uh, the uh, official language, uh, or English. So it's, it's not about, it's not a matter of um, memory capacity. It is about a matter of whether they are socially engaged, the students. That is, whether they want to enter into communication with you, I mean the teacher, um, in the language that you want them to communicate with you. Traditionally, we call it motivation. Uh, this student has a motivation issue, or these students have uh, problems, have motivational problems. But viewed from a socio-cultural perspective, yes, you can say this is a deficit in the student. The student has a deficit, which is called motivation problem. And literally, we are constructing a deficit in the student. These ESL students, they have a motivation problem. As if they really have something called motivation problem residing in them, a deficit. But if you talk about it within another discourse, like socio-cultural discourse, then it's just these students, they don't care about communicating with you, <laughs> with us, the teachers. They don't care about entering into that kind of social practice with us. Um, that is, they don't have a deficit, literally. Uh, they just couldn't care less about entering into communication with us, okay? <laughs> so that's a different, totally different issue with if we define the problem, if you call it a problem. If you define the issue from a different angle with a different theoretical tradition, then it's not the students which have a deficit. It's somehow we haven't been able to create that kind of milieu that hip hop artists can create. I mean, hip hop artists, whatever language they speak, they don't have this low motivation problem because hip hop, hip hop all over the world, whether you are rapping in Cantonese, in English, in French, in Vietnamese, they all, they all respond because they like to engage in that kind of social milieu, that kind of culture. And I have done, some years ago, I have done a project in a working class school, and these students were constructed as failures. We have band one, band two, band three students labeled, and these are band three students. Literally, these students were from the bottom 5% of the Hong Kong secondary schooling system. And then I brought in some hip-hop artists into the classroom, and suddenly, these students are rapping long stretches of English lyrics, okay? Before, they wouldn't even write a, a single sentence in English. They were constructed, they were seen as failures in their English. But after, after we have engaged socially, engaged their interests, and they would spend hours and hours to learn the lyrics in order to perform the songs. I can send you, I can send Patsy this uh, documentary I have made about our hip hop project. So you will see these students, Hong Kong kids, Hong Kong students, and they were rapping in English. And of course, we don't start right from English, we start from Cantonese rap. And then moving to bilingual rap, okay, Cantonese, English rap, and then English rap. And students are free to construct, 
to compose their lyrics, write their lyrics in any languages they like. So they can have Mandarin, Cantonese, English. And, and so through this socially engaging practice with the artists sharing their ideas about how they, how they do their raps, the students are engaged into doing it, into communicating using this semiotic system, this meaning-making system. And you know how I learned myself, learn Mandarin? I mean, spoken form of Mandarin. Um, because I grew up in uh, British colonial Hong Kong, right? At that time, Mandarin wasn't a core subject. So uh, I learned uh, Chinese, the uh, standard written, and, uh, written Chinese, reading and writing, no problem. Uh, but spoken, uh, I learned spoken Cantonese. I mean, I speak Cantonese. I learned spoken Mandarin Chinese through watching TV dramas. <laughs> Stop Korean TV dramas. Dub into Mandarin Chinese. Okay, <laughs> so you see that kind of uh, cultural practice. Uh, it's a cultural practice to watch TV dramas dub into uh, a certain language. So that way, I have I have taken a lot of Putonghua classes. Putonghua is spoken Mandarin, but I didn't succeed in. Somehow I didn't succeed. I just couldn't learn in a classroom context. But by watching Korean TV dramas like those marathon, marathons, okay, <laughs> Korean TV drama watching marathons, I was totally immersed in the Mandarin speaking context, but with Korean content. Okay, so that kind of engagement really gave me, really gave me the uh, Putonghua fluency. But nowadays, the Hong Kong government is trying to hammer this into their students. Learn Putonghua, this is your mother tongue. Mother tongue, actually, no. But the mother country's mother tongue, OK? And students, the more you hammer it, the more they resist it, right? The more they resist it. So it's not about motivation problem. It's about how do we engage them in a kind of social practice, where the language is part of, natural part of that practice. So now the third um, ideology is the banking model, uh, uh, Ferry, the uh, Paulo Ferry, the Brazilian uh, critical pedagogy uh, scholar. Um, language, but this essentialist, um, this essence, language as commodified, standardized set of knowledge items and skills, and language learning and teaching as seen as transaction, and this has turned us teachers into service providers passing on to you standard, standard action, okay? So I, w I will not be able, to, I w I'm not the best service provider in Hong Kong because I would be constructed as someone who hasn't, po hasn't uh, acquired this standard British uh, BBC action, okay? Even someone coming from Australia would not be the best service provider, would be constructed not as the best service provider because they have these advertisements, like BBC English. So it's kind of, they think of accent as kind of a precious commodity that you can, you can uh, provide to your students in a transaction. Um, so this is, well, this is totally ideological, but even if you look at, if you look at it as a technical issue, it still, it still doesn't work. It still doesn't work. Um, accents are so much embodied and it's so much tied into your feeling, okay? Your, your pronunciation so much tied into your affect, your emotion, and your feeling of who you are, right? So if the person resists that accent, there's no way you can get the student to perform that accent. The person can perform that for you, but the person can resist that accent. So, um, but this commodification of uh, language teaching, especially TESOL in Southeast Asia, um, it reaches to a climax in some uh, cities like in Tokyo. Uh, I have a, a, a researcher friend, Masaki Oda, and also uh, Rosalind Appleby uh, from Australia. Uh, Rosalind has done, Appleby has done some research on the charisma man in constructed, actually a TESOL teacher, constructed as charisma man in those advertisements of the language, English language schools in Tokyo. 
So, and actually, that position is not a comfortable position, even though you feel this is a superior position, because it imposes stereotypes on you. So say, for example, if you are a uh, blonde, white man, you got this TESOL qualification, you want to teach English in Southeast Asia, and then you got hired by these uh, institutes to teach English, and then they will position you, pigeonhole you into a kind of charismatic, charming, uh, romantic, okay? <laughs> so um, go get that book from Rosalind Appleby, okay? The Charisma Man. Okay? You might, as a teacher, you might not be like to be thought about that way. And you might not want to be commodified as a des object of desire. Okay. So um, that kind of positioning, we, are, we have been talking about positioning in our class, of different kinds of ELT teachers, I mean different kinds of TESOL teachers, um, is problematic, right? Because uh, it sets up a ladder about who is qualified to teach English, number one. Number two is it turns that relationship between teacher and student as a mutually transforming relationship, mutually discussing things that are of interest to them, into a totally different thing. Okay? Um, in Hong Kong, you are turned into an uh, examination coach. That the students position you as an examination coach. If you don't teach them the examination skills for the English exam, then they are not satisfied unhappy clients. Okay. So this kind of commodification is quite hideous because it creeps in slowly and we are called service providers and think, okay, it's just a name, doesn't matter. But it's more than a name. It transforms the teacher-student relationship and it becomes a totally different thing, teaching and uh, learning. Whereas, sir, my idea of the teacher-student relationship is both teachers and students are engaged in fluid co-creation of diverse language resources appropriate for social practice situated. So in Hong Kong and many Asian societies we've got, we have uh, schemes like native English speaker schemes. So I have friends who are native English teachers and they don't like the kind of positioning they got from their students. So the students see them as all oh, just speaking and playing games and just see them as that kind of uh, teacher. Uh, some of my native English teacher friends, they would like to actually teach them a broad range of topics, but they got positioned by the institution into teaching speaking, mostly. Um, and then they were not allowed to learn, they were not allowed, I mean they were discouraged to learn the local languages of students. So the native English teachers, their purity is where their uh, price is, okay? So once you got polluted, okay, by the local languages, if you learn too much of their local students' languages, then you are not a precious commodity anymore. But some teachers, some native English teachers told me they just pick up some Cantonese words, slangs, and then they just sprinkle it and the students suddenly become so attentive to them. So it just helps the students to say, hey, we are engaged in uh, communicative practice. I'm not just here to receive your precious commodity, but you're really interested in what I'm interested in, and then it's the two-way engagement. So, and then the domination of the immersion, immersion model, that metaphor is really a metaphor that sticks, okay? It's a sticky metaphor. That is, it sticks to people's understanding of how language learning takes place. The monolingual principle, maximum exposure hypotheses, and so on and so forth. Now these principles, they have certain elements of truth in it. It's not totally wrong. I would call them partial truths. Of course, the more you're exposed to a language, the more 
the, the, the chances. So the more I am exposed to Mandarin speaking TV dramas, the more the chances I pick up Mandarin, right? But the first thing is I have to be engaged enough to watch these TV dramas for 24 hours nonstop, right? So there's some partial truths in all these principles, maximum exposure and uh, uh, more and uh, uh, having uh, the uh, immersing you in so I was immersed in the Mandarin speaking TV dramas right when I was doing the marathons but they do they also have the subtitles to help me so I can read the subtitles so I immersed but there's also not just one language in that immersion um, so these these all principles, they have certain elements of truth, but if they are taken to the extreme, then we lose what is most, we lose sight of what's most, most important, which is to engage the students in the first place, uh, to have them to be aligned with our goals in the first place. So, uh, in Hong Kong, it's a very ideological. The, uh, policy. So uh, in 98, our former Minister of Education, we must ban, what we must ban in the classroom is mixed code, for, commonly known as changers, that's not language at all. But actually, if you look at any transcript, which I can provide, it's not, it's not that, okay? It's well-formed language, okay? People are just switching between the codes, it's well-formed languages, it's not like uh, it's not like what she's called Chinglish. And, and then Chris Patton, the last governor, what we don't want is for young people to be taught in Chinglish rather than either English or Chinese. And that's what we're trying to avoid at the moment. So again, this is easy rhetoric, this linguistic purism, this kind of rhetoric. Um, it, actually, it, 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 is, it isn't informed by education research. Okay, It isn't informed by solid evidence-based research that if you teach purely in one language you will produce better results than if you allow the familiar linguistic resources to come into the classroom. So um, there is this uh, often, often used counter argument which I can understand which is okay if we are teaching students teach all students English, if we allow them to use their familiar linguistic resources, they will all, because of the uh, principle of maximum ease, they will all fall back on their familiar languages and then there will be, there, will, there, will, there won't be enough opportunities for them to practice their English, right? So yes, I can understand, but then that argument depends on this coercive model of education. That is, your students, they need to be coerced to learn the language. Okay. But if in like the example I provided, the hip hop example, if students are engaged in learning that language in order to achieve something, the students will put in the effort. So the cross of the matter is, is not uh, policing your classroom, not allowing the students to use their familiar resources so that they all will be immersed in the target language. Yes, that is true if it's a coercive model that your students don't want to learn this language in the first place. So you have to impose it on them. You have to police this. So, but if you don't have this coercive model of language teaching and learning, if we can win the students over through socially engaging projects, then if we allow them to use their familiar resources, the output can be in the form you like them to do, that is the standard form, the standard language form, which you want to give them to pass the exam or to have the capital. Okay. So, um, so I've talked about the policy context in Hong Kong. It's very difficult for us to develop plurilingual approaches especially in content uh, teaching in Hong Kong. Um, the situation in Hong Kong is the majority of students speak Cantonese as their first language, read and write Chinese as a first language. 
but because of a whole cluster of factors, both parents and the mainstream society, they value English medium education, English immersion education, much, much more than Chinese medium education in Hong Kong. So we have this huge task of helping students to learn their content in English, physics, chemistry, biology. So I'll skip through uh, the policy, okay? The policy is, uh, just to bring you up to date, is right now um, the government allowed 25% of the curriculum in grade 7 to grade 10 to be taught in English. And then junior secondary, schools are free to choose their medium of instruction. They can choose English or they can do, choose Chinese. Chinese meaning spoken Cantonese and written standard Chinese. But the universities in Hong Kong, we have eight universities, they are all English medium. So you don't, you don't need to do any other policy planning. Once you have planned it at the top, the rest will fall into its place. So all the parents are all crowding, trying to get a place for the children in the English medium schools. So, and, but not all students have the kind of resources to learn only in English, okay? So here's the dilemma. Uh, parents want their children to learn in English medium schools. The government said, Separation approach. I don't want you to use any of the familiar languages in a classroom. If you call yourself English medium class, teach only in English. Now you see this kind of policy, uh, this dilemma created by this kind of policy. That is the ideology that you can become bilingual by taking monolingual classes. Okay, monolingual English classes, monolingual Chinese classes. And then because parents all want their kids to be in English medium schools, so their kids might, even their kids might not be able to do it only in English, okay, purely, purely in English. So you can see the situation, okay. So it's against this context that the innovation approach of this school. So this school, the teachers, they have come up with an innovation, innovative approach, a bilingual NOx approach against, against, the, against the policy, okay? Bilingual NOx approach. So, and then I'll show you two examples. One is a Bantu school, um, Chinese medium school, but because parents want the students, parents don't want the students to be just pigeonholed into Chinese medium classes because they know in the end if you want your child to get ahead, they need to study in the English medium university, in Hong Kong at least. So, and then another school, so I'll show you. So this school, they have students whose proficiency is intermediate. Okay, not really too basic, but not really too good. So the teachers design in-house materials. This is a great um, junior secondary, um, grade seven science uh, class. And they're talking about uh, boiling and the uh, filtration. And the teacher has, format, has formatted the NOx in such a way that it is side by side. And you can see that um, it is parallel. So you can see the key term, boiling. This is a key term in Chinese, a key term in English. The definition of a key term in Chinese and in English. So students can easily cross-reference on the same page, uh, side by side. Now, then there is this argument. Okay, if you provide them with bilingual notes, they will only look at Chinese notes. Not really, not really, because, okay, because, um, okay, this is another example, a lab report, bilingual lab report, and they are 
format it in a way that this is the Chinese, this is the English. Um, so, and then the key terms, the English, the Chinese, side by side for easy cross-referencing. And students can produce some form of lab report uh, in English with this kind of scaffolding. Uh, now, to counter the argument that if you provide bilingual notes to students, it will just look at the Chinese part or the, the, the familiar part, they will ignore the English part, so they will never learn English, right? This is this uh, counter argument. Um, the school teachers, when they develop this approach, they have also developed systematic principles. So these are the principles that the teachers gave me. They have written up a paper, and they gave me this paper, and I accept it. So they say, first of all, they analyze students' existing needs and their academic proficiencies. And then the aims of the bilingual program are explained to students at the beginning. So students buy into this bilingual program. So you have student buy-in. You explain to them. You bring students on the same page. Tell students why we are doing these, these bilingual notes. Okay? And the familiar languages, for example, the Chinese, are used to, they are used to present the content at the beginning, and then some English gradually introduced from vocab to the text level. Vocabulary, sentence, and then paragraphs. And then the introduction of the English text is fully contextualized in the curriculum topic, in the science topic, with all the multimodals, with all the other visual support. And the language panels, that is, language teachers, collaborate with the content teachers. And the last part, that is, teachers need to have confidence in carrying it out because teachers, under all kinds of pressure, can revert back to the monolingual approach. So they have tried this out, and they have seen improvement of their students in terms of their proficiencies in the second language. So that's one example. It's against all odds, against the policy context, against all kinds of uh, constraints that the teachers, they have come up with this kind of bilingual approach to help to scaffold the academic literacy development of their students in the secondary school. Then another school, um, is a band one school students have better English proficiency. And the science teacher is a grade seven science class, Ms. Zhang, the science teacher. And she allows students to switch to Chinese in their science journals to continue to recount their science experience. So this is the science journal of a student. And the student is doing the graph and doing the procedure in English. And then suddenly, the student here says, use Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and then she continues to explain uh, what she did in the experiment. And she also takes pictures of her experimental results and then illustrated, very multimodal. Okay. So, and then the teachers comments on it and and gives the English resources for the students to express in English. The next time the students would learn how to express this idea in English. So now this teacher is very, very inquiry based. Most Hong Kong science teachers are a lot like that. Okay, most science Hong Kong teachers just drill students for their examination. But this science teacher is very unique. She has adopted an inquiry-based approach to science teaching and learning. So she encourages, she selected some topics, she told me, that are, that are safe topics to do experiments on in the home setting. So she encourages students, so she will set a topic and encourages students to design the experiment and conduct the ex experiment at home and then keep a science journal. You can see this uh, kind of class workbook. And that way, beyond class time, students will be doing their independent inquiry at home on a science topic and writing up their science journals. 
And the teacher has been providing uh, writing scaffolding, like writing templates, to show how a science journal uh, is uh, organized. So students all got the support, the literacy support on how to write a science journal. And as students get so excited about recounting her, her experimental experience, she one sort one one out of English resources at this point. So she is bold enough to say use Chinese and then switch to Chinese to do that. And this teacher has successfully created this atmosphere, this trust. The students trust the teacher as long as I'm telling this exciting journey about my science inquiry, you won't care about what language I'm recounting this experience in. And also, um, she is, and she found a Chinese article on this topic about physics. Okay, I don't understand this physics it's about uh, the rubber band stretching it. So, and then she's been writing, discussing the experiment, experimental results, and then she found this Chinese uh, academic piece on this law, law of physics, okay? What is it? Hoax law, okay? And then she said here, I understand R uh, so great, okay? You know this R uh, is like Hong Kong style English. I understand uh, what the former minister of education in Hong Kong would call Chinglish, but I understand R uh, is perfectly okay. That ex that the R is a particle expressing her excitement. That is, I can understand it. So great. So you can almost feel the student's excitement that she can do both English, academic English and academic Chinese. And her knowledge is validated instead of marginalized or pun punished. So she has academic literacies in both languages by literacy. So. A gap, okay, she also, okay. This is another force to push it back, ga, okay. So another Cantonese particle to indicate her excitement about understanding the laws of physics for this topic. So, so Ms. Zhang's idea is to, in, to socially engage students into this kind of practice, inquiry practice. So once students get excited about engaging in this inquiry practice and recounting their experience in doing experiments, she allows them to use whatever resources, linguistic resources, multimodal resources, drawing, doing the picture, illustrating the picture, to recount, to, to talk about their scientific experimental res, uh, experiences. So you can see that the focus is on the experience the language is there to help them to express their experience. It's not the other way around. So Lisa Dalpit, I'm still coming back to her. Uh, her Harvard Education Review article in 1988. Um, she was talking about the African-American uh, children in uh, the United States and the need to, on the one hand, as teachers, we need to give them the so-called standard English, right? to pass the exam, to get ahead. On the other hand, we also want to validate, want to value what, what they bring to the classroom, which is their familiar linguistic resources, the African-American vernacular, African-American language. So Lisa Dalpit was talking about engaging students explicitly to talk about these two varieties of language and to get them to do bilingual dictionaries and to say that your familiar language is in no way inferior to the standard school language which you are required to learn. But just because we need to learn it to do the exam, so we can do this compa comparing and contrasting linguistically to help students to, to have confidence in shuttling between both languages. So I'll skip this actually. In the 1980s, we have had, in the 1980s, in Hong Kong, uh, R.K. Johnson, Keith Johnson has been doing research on bilingual approaches to teaching content, um, but it hasn't been followed up. 
So, so we can initiate change. And I understand all those uh, uh, pedagogical principles, maximum exposure, monolingual principle. There are certain elements of truth in it. I'm not saying that it's, it's all wrong. I'm just saying once we open up the classroom to multiple resources, not just linguistic resources, but multimodal resources, visual resources, and just use all kinds of resources to scaffold our students' learning. So, um, and then I need to talk about the relationship between the kind of government policy, it, it is more than an education issue, more than a language teaching issue. If you force students into one language track, the Chinese medium education, the English medium education in Hong Kong, like what the government in Hong Kong is doing right now, it is literally stratifying the school population into two classes of citizens. Given all the global, global domination of English, the English medium education students will be first class citizens. The Chinese medium education students will be second class citizens. I was doing research in Hong Kong just before I came. I was interviewing students and parents. And literally, they, they told me they felt like if they were doing Chinese medium education, they felt like they are second class citizens. Um, so it's all these ideological environment. Um, I'm not saying that it is right. We need to change that. And yet, if we don't provide access, but when we provide access, we also need to raise critical awareness. That is, it's not second class. It is not inferior. It's just we can explicitly engage students in discussing these issues, these metalinguistic issues, socio-political issues about language varieties in the classroom. So, um, so Alan Look, um, I have great respect for him, and this is a quote from him. Um, he's saying, "New human subjects, subjectivity." It's not monolingual, it's multilingual, it's plurilingual, transcultural. So his, his recommendation is accurately and fairly recognize and evaluate the cultural capital that students bring to school. That is all the cultural resources, linguistic resources. If students are, are familiar with hip hop, or students are familiar with their manga, or familiar with the comics, then we draw on these resources of the students. We build on their resources. Uh, cultural scripts and schematics, skills, knowledges, and practices, what Pierre Baudu calls cultural capital, in order to set the optimal conditions for transformation and conversion of these into a substantially modified and augmented version of school knowledge, a principled, culturally and linguistically sensitive, sociologically grounded, evidence-based, teaching was supplant deficit thinking. So these children don't have deficits. They don't have a motivation problem. Um, they, okay, it's, it's not. It's just we need to build on their linguistic resources, cultural resources. It can be their pop culture. Okay, students know a lot about pop culture that we don't know. And if we can build on their pop cultural resources, linguistic, diverse linguistic resources, it can be their home languages, community languages, then we can build a curriculum which is socially engaging and motivating and we don't need to police our classroom. One classroom, one language, okay? And, and we don't need to coerce students into learning this second language or this foreign language, right? So, so agency, talking about agency again, uh, uh, again quoting Alan, the agency to challenge and alter the dis discourses of law. In Hong Kong, it's the government policy, the discourses of the government officials of separation, uh, of the separation approach, one classroom, one language approach, this kind of policies. We, we, we just need to, like those, like those teachers in, in that school using the bilingual looks approach. So we just need to critique and cons consistently try to change these kinds of laws. Um, and I have a few minutes, and I'll show you what I'm doing right now. 
This is my rainbow diagram. Um, I show to Hong Kong school teachers, science teachers, history teachers. I, I say, this is a communicative repertoire. And our aim is to expand it, communicative repertoire of our students. So on the left-hand side, chances are students will have more resources on the left-hand side. Okay? The, and on the right-hand side, chances are they will need these to pass the exam to get ahead in their life. And then we show some multimodalities. We immerse these language practice coordinated with visual support, multimodal support, gesture, demonstration, images, graphic organizers, diagrams. And then we can draw on all kinds of linguistic resources the students bring with them like the teachers using the bilingual notes approach okay, so that we are building bridges um, among the different resources and we don't privilege these resources we don't send the wrong message to students saying that only the school examination language is worthwhile uh, your own familiar languages are not worthwhile we don't want to send that kind of messages to students okay? But we can, like Lisa Dalpit, explicitly engage students in discussing these matters. But in actual teaching and learning, we need to build upon what students have and expand their repertoire. And this is some, someone I found in the literature in CLEO, Content and Language Integrated Learning. So in Europe, in Germany, um, this is what, uh, what they are doing research upon. Activation of everyday life concepts together, they draw on the familiar language. Introduction of science conflicts, they use, they use familiar language. And then extension of scientific concepts and cons consolidation and application, then they use the L2. And I myself, what, this is what I'm doing now in Hong Kong in my research in the schools. And this, is, this model is what I'm developing right now. I call it the Multimodalities and Textualization Cycle, MEC. Um, one stage, there are three stages in this cycle. Creating a rich experimental, experiential context. And in this stage, you can use all kinds of visuals, YouTube videos, diagrams, actions, inquiry-based discovery activities, experiments. And then you can engage students in reading and note making. And you can draw on the rainbow diagram. They are free to use L1 and L2, spoken or written. And also free to draw on multimodalities. Okay. And then we design tasks to engage students in contextualizing the experience. So once they have gone through the inquiry, they need to write it up for presentation or for spoken presentation or written presentation. Then they are free to use L1 and L2. Okay. So this kind of multimodalities and textualization cycle I'm trying to experiment, experiment with in Hong Kong schools. Um, so that way, both the L1 and L2 get a chance to be drawn upon, but all fully contextualized. And students we try to engage students in explicitly talking about when you use L1, when you use L2, when you use both uh, contextualized in the curriculum topic and in your project. So this is the kind of model I'm trying to develop and trying to uh, do research upon and gather school uh, evidence upon so that later I can present it to the policy makers in Hong Kong. To keep the dialogue going, keep the dialogue going. They are not our enemies. I mean, we just need to, we just need to educate. We just need to educate each other, okay? They will educate me about the budget constraints, administrative constraints, and then I can educate them about the research that I'm doing. So keep the conversation. So with this, I'll end my presentation. Thank you.